All right, so what we're going to talk about is some really fabulous information regarding high performing teams. And why that's important is there's been, particularly in primary care, obviously challenges that we're all well aware of, particularly when we've been working in this space for some time. For, for you newbies, I'm no doubt you guys would have heard of some of these challenges along the way. There's obviously pressures coming from the top down with primary care. And as you can see, the burden of chronic disease is just getting more and more, isn't it? Over the age of 65, there's usually three or more. And every two minutes in Australia, there's an avoidable hospital admission associated with chronic disease going in through those doors. So there's really a lot of burden coming down. We've got an aging population. We're able to live a lot longer. Obviously medications is, and obviously the interventions that we can have now with surgical interventions keeps us alive. Funding, we've got the MBS models. Um, we're going to blow that up if we continue at the rate we are. So we need to be a little bit more innovative moving forward. And obviously there's that workforce. There's a, an aging workforce that's leaving. And then also we've got newcomers coming into the area that need that training and support to deal with that rapid fire space that you guys are working in at the coalface. So you'll hear what I reference as the healthcare home trial. And that's a new model of care that's been trialled across Australia at the moment in certain sites. We're not one of them. And what it's looking at is a different funding model to manage complex need clients. So it's looking at instead of that service fee that we currently have with MBS, where we can see anybody, no matter what their complexity of disease is, and bill an MBS item number, it's looking at can we actually give more um, care to those complex need clients and be remunerated accordingly, and less so to the people that don't really need as much intervention. We're also looking more at prevention, and again, the cancer screenings targeting that as well. How can we get in early enough so that we don't prevent ongoing issues and complications associated with disease? And can we prevent people actually getting cancer? Then we have health promotion, i.e. just what we've heard about with breast you know, screening Australia. We have also seen it with all the other cancer screenings across Australia as well, different promotions and access to that. And then the innovation models of nurse-led care. So we're gonna talk about today in particular if we can, about Bodenheimer's building blocks. And while we're talking about Bodenheimer's building blocks, which is the name of the person that actually created this model of care, we're gonna talk about why it is that they created it and what we're trying to achieve. Because I think if you don't understand what we're trying to achieve, the model is less likely to mean anything to you. So we're looking at the chronic disease incidence in Australia and you can see the impact that cancer has and right up the top is those respiratory issues as well. We have more than one in three of potentially preventable hospital admissions which is due to one of those top eight and 30% of problems we're managed in general practice were associated with those top eight. So we're seeing a lot of cancers coming through our doors. More than 11 million Australians, so 50%, how's that for a number? 50% of Australians have at least one chronic condition. So let's halve this room right now. I'm gonna to go to the room that's not gonna get it, yeah? <laughs> I'm the side of the room. And 31% of disease burden in 2011 was preventable and due to modifiable risk factors, which is key here, isn't it? How can we get them to understand the risk factors? And I like that breast risk screen tool online. I think that's gonna be really useful working with your clients just to demonstrate to them what it is that they can do to empower themselves. So Bodenheim is a model of care, as I said, that looks at how can we have high performing practices in our catchments? What are the things that underpin a really high performing general practice. And this is what they've come up with. And they call it the quad aim, because of course there's four key things. It's an approach to optimize health system performance by 
pursuing improvements in population health. What do we understand by population health? Come on, you can say something. What do we understand by population health? Yeah, we saw some of that before in the cancer screening slides, didn't we? We saw the population health broken down by the LGA of cancer screening rates, yeah, in our areas. So that's population health. There's another key area which you'll find on the Primary Health Network site that will have POP Health. Whereabouts is that, Dee? Uh, you're referring to the, like the LGA information. Yeah. And the needs the assessment. Needs assessment. Yeah. Analysis, yeah. yeah, and that's all freely available to all of you to go and have a look at at any time that you're interested and think, what is my rates in this particular area? So if you pop onto the West Vic PHN site and you click on the needs assessment, you'll find all that information broken down to each of your regions. So go and have a look at that. I really encourage it. And then we have the patient's experience of care. Why is that important, do you think? I'm gonna look at you two now. <laughs> Could you look at the screen going, don't look at me. <laughs> what do you think is important about the patient's experience? Um, experience of the patient when they go to clinics like us. Yeah. It's very important because if they feel unsafe or traumatized, they won't come back anymore. Brilliant. Experience is best. That's right. How can we make it so that they feel like we're accessible and approachable enough for them to have the discussions required for sensitive topics and issues? <laughs> Fantastic. Reducing the per capita cost to the healthcare system. Similar to what I was talking about before, wasn't it? That in terms of the current delivery style of MBS, it doesn't matter how complex your needs are, you can still access the same amount of care through the MBS item numbers as some with complex needs. So how can we be accountable to that healthcare dollar? How can we make sure that we're targeting, targeting the right people and being really ethical towards a healthcare dollar? How can we be really proactive in the management of our clients and prevent avoidable hospital admissions, surgeries, and people getting complex needs um, and diseases? And improving the work life for providers. What do you think about that one? You like that one? Prove providing our work life and um, APNA particularly talk about our scope of practice, yeah? How can we work to the top of our license so that we can be working as autonomous practitioners safely within our license so that we can deliver good services to our community members, yeah? So what can we do with that? Can we have a nurse lead clinic like this cancer screening clinics we've been talking about in the last two workshops? When working in any of the four quad aim areas, it's important to rem remember right at the heart of it is who? Yeah, the patients always, that's who we're trying to impact. Very teeny tiny, isn't it? Even though I've got my glasses on, it's gonna be very hard for me to read that. <laughs> but the quad aim has four distinct areas. I'm gonna go close enough to the screen here so I can read them for you. Ah, oh, neither can I. So I'm gonna go here so I can read it for you. So improve patient experience of care. Care is tailored to the needs of the individual. So we hear quite often now, don't we? Patient-centered care. Everyone heard that as a common theme of late? What does that even mean? What does that mean to you guys? Yep. So it's not tailored to their disease, it's tailored to them. It's factored in what is their psychosocial impacts, what's their environmental needs, what is it that's going to enable a person to live independently and well supported in our communities rather than inadvertently ending up in hospital. Coordinated and that customised care, what does that mean to you guys? coordinated. Often I hear people saying, I do a care plan for my clients, comes in and I send out the referrals. What about what comes back? Do we see that? Are we seeing the information that comes back? What's required from our perspectives once we've actually referred out? 
i.e. have they gone off and had some screening done and recommendations managed, yeah, and recommended to them that we can support them with. Safe and effective care, timely and equitable access, increased skills and confidence to manage one's own care needs. Important, isn't it? Again, how can we make sure that that person can live independently and well supported in the community? Can we connect them to social supports in our region? What is around in our region? All of those sorts of things, um, just that next layer that you can deliver with your care planning. Not just thinking about allied services, but social supports that are greater, that can keep them well and supported in their communities. Improved health outcomes and population managers, we're trying to aim to reduce the disease burden, increase the focus on prevention. Can we do more screening early? Yeah. Improving the quality of care, the individual's behaviour and physical health. And we spoke a lot in the early session, I think it was workshop one, about patient communication, didn't we? How can we engage them in their own health and wellbeing? Improved cost efficiency and sustainability in healthcare. So the resourcing to primary care. And we heard the cancer screening team bringing mobile screening to the areas. That's what we're talking about. How can we, instead of expecting a patient to drive hours to access care, make it a little bit more um, localised and accessible to them? Improved access in primary care reduces demand on the hospital system. It's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? How can we provide these services so they're not having to go elsewhere to receive them? Improved healthcare provider experience, increasing your clinician and staff satisfaction. Are you guys getting better enjoyment out of your role as a consequence of working more to the scope of your practice? Increasing flexibility and scope for innovation. Is this a new service delivery? Just coming around to you guys as a question here. Is this new for you, this cancer screening within your general practice? Or have you been doing it for years? You have? We have, but we've probably um, widened our scope of doing it. You know, it was just probably oh, yeah, a little bit ad hoc. Yeah. Every care plan is it's implemented in that. Every health assessment is implemented in that. Great. Um, 45 to 49, starting the education off. So Excellent. Yeah, so it's always been there, but it's just, we're just saying more organised. Yeah, um, more streamlined and more proactive is the response there, isn't it? So it's in every health assessment, whether it's a 40 to 49, it's in your over 75 health checks, it's in all your care plans as just a common question that you're asking everyone. So your screening rates and your prevention rates are probably pretty high at the moment. <laughs> you can't see the pen cat report. And what about for you guys? Is this new for you, having cancer screening at TriStar? Yeah, we might do it again or do it that much. You're not doing much yet. Yeah, so there's opportunities there for sure. And I heard you say that you've been doing it for some time, particularly in women's health. Yeah. And what about in terms of cancer screening per se? Well, we've recently participated in a, a Menzies bowel project with the National Bowel Screen where we've actively identified our Aboriginal clients in the 50 to 74. And in doing that, we literally created a database of them and checked for anyone that flipped into the 50 age group each month. Great. And we had the kits as part of the pilot in the clinic so we could run through the tips of doing a kit. Yeah. Um, encourage them to obviously to participate and when they did follow through to see if they completed if we hadn't got a result back. So we've uh, we've gone on with support from the PH to embed that now so it won't stop. Mm. We will have the kits until halfway through next year and we hope that the pilot evaluation will mean that we can continue to have those kits into the future because it's making a big difference. And so what I'm hearing in terms of this particular point 
is you've implemented something based on a trial, you did the Menzies trial, you've seen that it's targeted in a certain age group, you've seen the outcomes, and now you're hoping for additional funding because clearly it's had an impact on your role. Yeah, and that's the clinician and provider experience we're talking about, working to the top of your license. And, and how about for you, going from that ad hoc process to now being just in its usual part of service delivery? Yeah. You know, each time they come in, we've got it actually listed in our kit um, when, when their fecal alcohol blood test is due to do the national bowel screen. We've identified people with a colonoscopy that, you know, are excluded, all those sorts of things. It's just becoming a, a working development, really. And yeah, it's, it's really quite exciting. Yeah, and that's what we're talking about. So particularly for this, it's not only about, you know, we're reducing costs, we're being proactive, but we're also providing so much more in our roles, working with clients, and that translates across the population, doesn't it? It translates across our teams. They get enthused because we're enthused, and it translates across our communities as well because they go out and they talk about this fantastic service that they're receiving within their communities, which is exactly what we're after. You pick up a lot of other things that have been missed in the system. As yeah. Well. Um, you know, people that have had breast cancer or yes. cervical cancer that haven't been followed up and those sorts of things. So it just expands out once you really get into it. Yeah, the proactive management and prevention. And it's absolutely endless, isn't it, in terms of what you can pick up and how you can pick it up. So we're looking about quality improvement culture in our practices, and that's what Bodenheim's ethos is about. So this is in your manuals, in your cancer screening toolkit. So you'll see this again. You can go back and have a look at this. Four areas, there's an opportunity to build a whole team approach how can we start to embed new systems in our workplace that brings in all team members? And we're going to do a little bit of mind mapping on this later on today. So get ready for that. Keep yourselves excited and posed. We're also looking at how can we improve cancer screening rates, which is what I'm hearing happening here and absolutely here as well. And the opportunities will come. You'll get ideas from what these ladies are doing and go back to your teams potentially and say, hey, can we do that as well? It sounds like there's some really good things that we can be involved in. And then improving patients' outcomes by early detection. Yeah, let's get screening happening and getting something done before, you know, obviously it's too late and we're ending up with um, a cancer diagnosis or treatment with surgery or, you know, chemo or the like. And we're looking at reducing cancer related burden of disease. So again, you'll see this picture in your workbooks as well. What are the benefits? So we've got employee satisfaction. So if you're loving your job, you're less likely to leave, which is important. So we're keeping that quality in our staff at, at the coalface, which is right where we want people to stay. We're also getting less patients suffering through the medical infections and injuries as well. We're also getting less of that revolving door happening. People are actually coming out with good planning and good support structures out in the community. And we're reducing all of the um, risks associated with medical errors, etc. So these are the building blocks. There's a few of them and we're going to play with them. So we're going to have a little bit of fun with these because they're essential components. Think of them as foundations to a home. Okay. If we don't have these things rock solid in place, uh, is the ha house stable? No. So we need to make sure that we have the bottom tier, particularly those first lot, really well embedded down before we go to the second tier, the third tier and right at the top. So we have engaged leadership. What does that mean to you? What does engaged leadership mean? What does engaged leadership? Have a stab. They 
Great. 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 Leaders across every single space in our environment, aren't they, in terms of our general practice environment. We can have leaders in the reception area, we can have medical assistants, we can have general practitioners, we can have the nurses team, yes, and we can have the exec team as well. But engaged is a key word as well, isn't it? What are you passionate about? Yeah, and that's what I'm hearing from you, particularly around that Menzies trial. I'm really passionate about this. I really enjoy it. And that's what we're looking for because people who are really passionate about something will drive change. They really want to do that because they really believe heart, soul, boots and all that I want to do this, yeah? So they're the ones that are beginning to say, I've got an idea, can we do it? And how I'm going to find out some information and have some solutions on how we might go about it, okay? Engage leadership. And then we have data-driven improvement. Data, 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 gotta love it. And you guys are going, can't get my pen cat, don't worry about that, it's coming. In the workbooks, you'll see lots of pen cat um, recipes. In pen cat, you'll also see lots of recipes for other things as well. You would have heard about the PIP QI, um, looking at screening rates for things like burden of disease and risk factors to disease, such as smoking, alcohol, weight classifications, etc. So we're starting to be really proactive in this space, aren't we? We want to know how many clients are coming in and what classification they've got of those key risk factors. Who's had influenzas for COPD and diabetes and HbA1c's? We're being really quite in, um, you know, proactive in those spaces, aren't we? And being really intentional in those spaces. Patient team partnership, what does that mean? An environment where breastfeeding have their requirements to operate their service, but become rather than you know the breastfeeding system being this way and the fit with the Aboriginal clients being so vastly different, we weren't getting together, so we worked to this beautiful, and now it's a really great collaborative care yeah. to meet the needs of our clients. And again, it's seeing each client as equal to us, that we're in this together, yeah? I'm meeting you with what you're, you, where you're at. And if you think about those under-screened areas of cancer screening and what often is the barriers, even more important, isn't it? That we're meeting patients with where they're at and being really accommodating. Impanelment, now I'm gonna help you with this one because that's probably not a common one that we hear. Empanelment's about teams of people working to support one client, so that client knows who to go to and that who their little team of care is. It's just a really interesting word, isn't it? But empanelment. Population management. We talked about pop health before, didn't we? So population management. What is our data showing us? What's the needs assessment showing us in our area? What should we really be focusing our activities on? Yeah? rather than just the, the top ones that we usually get remunerated for, which could be diabetes and asthma once upon a time, what actually would be a really good quality improvement in our region because we have a real need for it in our community, communities? And how are we gonna be strategic in that space and can we make a difference? Prompt access to care. So if we're only open from eight to four, and people work in our areas, can they come and see a GP? Can they come and see us? Can women access us? Can men access in certain age demographics? Um, if there's big distances that people have to travel, have they got carers that can drive them to us? Or can we be a little bit flexible in terms of our opening hours, opening on weekends, opening a little bit later, a couple of nights a week? Can we make it so that clients don't necessarily have to come to us? Telehealth's been great for this, hasn't it? Instead of people having to drive two and a half hours to go to a specialist, sit there for five minutes and then drive two and a half hours back. That's what we're talking about here. Team-based care. We're all in this together. Who can assist who? And what roles are best supported by whom? Okay, so thinking about admin roles, if you've got a quick, young, savvy 
receptionist who's smart on the computer and you've got someone over here typing like this, who's best to do it? That person, as long as it's within scope of practice. Then we have continuity of care, which is where empanelment comes in, isn't it? If you've seen someone and they've opened up about what's going on for them with particularly vulnerabilities with their social needs, they probably want to see you again. Less likely to want to see somebody else because they've got that connection with you. Um, what about the comprehensiveness and care coordination? That's what I'm hearing about what you were talking about instead of you know, that breast green area and you, they were going this way and you were going that way and you matched what each other needed. It's having those conversations. And I was just in Corowa on Monday with a team that are doing collaborative shared management plans. So the ambulance service, the community nurses, the hospital and the um, primary care facility are doing complex need share care planning for their clients so that everyone has got one document that follows the client around rather than there's being three or four documents of the same information. Yeah, the community nurses are taking two hours to formulate a care plan that primary care could never take that amount of time. So why not use that time and that really comprehensive document across the whole team? What other things can we leverage off each other and be really shared in the delivery to support our clients? Templates of the future, what does that mean? Templates of the future. Great. Improving, sharing. And, you know, um, Rivka and I was having this conversation this morning about stealing shamelessly. It's in your booklet as well. You'll see that. If you hear of something that someone's doing that's, you know, really refined and cool, rather than recreating the wheel, share it. So if it's something that you guys are doing that you go, I'd really love to do that, or vice versa, how are they doing this? Instead of you spending time, you know, which we all say that we need more and more of, can we share things and be a lot more collaborative in our shared mission to reduce and do no harm to our clients and our communities? So we're going to do a little bit of an activity. I'm going to invite my partner in crime to come up and um, walk you through it. But you're going to be really excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. The aim of um, the aim of the activity now is to combine some of that knowledge. So using a mind mapping format. So remember, there there are no wrong ways to go about it. Think about your breast cancer screening activity that you might be planning or you might already be doing, but might need some further refinement and start to map that out. So for you, the central idea will be your breast cancer screening uh, clinic or services. You might not want to call it a clinic. You can call it whatever you like, but that's the focus of the thinking and the planning that you're going to be doing. But you're going to use the framework of the Bodenheimer 10 building blocks to check that you are thinking along all of those important elements and that you are addressing them. We were going to break them down into the, 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 three, um, the three areas there so um, that each of the teams would ensure that you look at um, engaged leadership, the data-driven improvement, um, patient team partnerships and the like. But I think I've changed my mind. So what I want you to do is to map out your own cancer screening um, workflow and activities and what you need to do next. And then double check against those Bodenheimer um, building blocks to ensure that you've considered it from that patient perspective, from the empanelment. Do you need to think about your, um, your engaged leadership? Do you need to work with some of those in the more senior positions and, and create the champions to really make sure that this sticks? Um, are you going to end up with that template for the future? You, um, you were speaking about, you know, the introduction of some of that checking as part of your, your care planning templates so that it becomes part of normal business. And while I was sitting there, I was thinking the solutions don't need to be complex or complicated. They can be really quite simple, but massively impactful 
because they're translatable. They don't necessarily take a long amount of time. They're easily understood and they are really impactful. So what I like about that is the simplicity of one improvement that actually has that ripple effect, effect of having a really significant outcome on um, the conversations that we have with patients and the like. So think about um, the ability to, to make that a sustainable um, activity going, going forward. So use those dot points, which are the, the, the 10 building blocks, to map out your breast cancer screening um, program. So I'm going to give you probably 20 minutes or so to have a think about that. We'll, Kim and I will wander around and, and give you a hand and um, give you some guidance if you need. We're going to be having a look at each of your mind maps after the lunch break. So use some colour, use imagery if that is going to be an easy way for you to communicate your ideas and your actions and have a little bit of fun with it. And what we're going to do is put them all together after lunchtime and see what everybody is planning and, and doing, looking at where the overlap is. And again, we're going, to be, um, we're going to be stealing shamelessly from each other to say, oh, that's a really good idea. I'm going to try and implement that too. So I really do want to really emphasize that too, that if you're at the beginning stages, you're working with some other practices that have some really great ideas that I'm sure they'd be very happy to, to share with you because if it's worked for one practice, chances are it's going to work for another too. So um, there isn't uh, really you know, too much magic about it. So start with your central idea, um, create your branches of, and you might want to structure it in the way, for example, of what is the GP's role in this? What's the nursing role in this? what's an administrative role in this and they might form your first three branches and then you start to map that out of what you're going to do and what you need to have in place and you might find link linkages between the branches between admin and nursing between nursing and the gp so start to map that out and and see what you come up with so 20 minutes let's see how you go any questions before you get started okay all right, so we want a, a, a big cloud, a big cloud in the middle, a big bubble in the middle with your cancer screening um, clinic or service. All right, it looks like the writing has slowed down, so it's uh, probably a really good time to maybe bring this together. We were going to introduce the, um, the sharing of that knowledge after lunch, but considering we've only just had the last bite of, of morning tea, we thought we'll just kick on um, and perhaps get you to share the information of your, your mind maps and um, you know, what you've put together. And also just sort of that cross-referencing cross with the, the 10 building blocks. So we might start with the, the table in the middle. <laughs> Hold up your mind map and um, I guess just, just talk us through what you've got there and oh, I love the hands there. That's very, very good. Are we gonna get them out the front? Yeah, come, come on over here because um, then um, we, we get you on the camera as well. So come and stand nice and close to me so that the, the mic will pick that up as well. And I'll, I'll help you to, I'll, I'll be your, your display girl and you can do the, the talking. Excuse the spelling mistakes for a start. <laughs> um, our goal in case was to increase our screening activities and then increase accurate, have accurate data. And we've been working on this for a little while and we've actually um, done some of these things but it's also led us on to where we need to go with it. So we've all taken responsibility for it. So we've got our GPs, We've got our administration, we've got our management, and we've got our nurses. The nurses is the biggest one. Of course <laughs> it is. <laughs> For our, our GPs, um, we can see, and what we're trying to do is for them to be the advocate for this cancer screening, but they need accurate data and everything. So, But they're the ones that can actually re recommend. One of the biggest problems we found within our clinic was that our recalls weren't being updated correctly. Um, they'd go in and they'd check them, no action, but then the recall wasn't updated. So when we were doing our 
um, people who were eligible for breast, breast screen or in our recalls, um, we were finding we had a lot of information in there that wasn't correct. So um, the girls have been working on really cleansing our data and making sure our records are right. So we've printed everything off and then we've, we've had to physically go in and check if they have had breast screen. And if they, oh, this is just an example, but we've done it for bowel screen, we've done it for cervical, cervical screening as well. So that we're actually there. Then we've had a session with our doctors just showing, showing them how to use the computer and how to, it really is quite quick to go and do it and then it saves us nurses having to go back in and do it and correct it and it also is just good, good patient care. So we've looked at, at all that, we're um, updating our records also with our diagnosis, making sure our diagnoses are correct to what is on we use best practice, so making sure, not free scrolling data, not free scrolling diagnosis, not adding to it, not even just putting a question mark in it, making sure it matches what is in our computer so that we've then got a clean database to recall. If we want to recall all our pe people that have had mammograms, we've got the word, not, not mammograms, breast cancer, we've got things in there that are able to be recalled and not what um, yeah, what, what that one doctor thought to call it. So it's just you know making our data clean. Um, the nurses have we've added this to all our care plans. It's part of our template. We've added or oh, we've got breast screen, we've got mammogram, uh, mammograms, cervical screening test. We've got osteoporosis, looking at the DEXA scan, and we've got our fecal alcohol blood. And it's all under women's health, but then when we do write up our care plan, we just take the WRO, put a capital M, and then we just take out what we want out of it. So it's a workable template that we can use for any person. So the men should be screened for osteoporosis. Not only the women, the men should be as well. And you could probably swap the cervical screening for a for prostate check. Exactly um, so happens. right exactly there you go. What happens. We go and we look at asymptomatic with um, men's health, with asymptomatic, we, we do all that sort of thing. Yeah. So it becomes a workable template. Um, eligible clients um, record check. Every patient that we go into, we try and encourage that the, all the records are updated all the time. Um, in, we add all the information. Our patients walk out with a, a, a folder that has their care plan in it. So we're adding in, We've, we were already adding in our screening, in our care plan is screening for depression as well. So we're adding information to that, but we're also adding in the National Bowel Screen um, brochure. We add in the breast screen, we add in the cervical screening, we add in the, the um, changes to the cervical screening. Even though they, they may not um, be eligible for, say, a cervical screening test, they may be out of the age group, but we put it in so that it alerts them if you have any symptoms, come back and see us. You may not be eligible, but you've had your screening test, but if you have any symptoms, come back and see us. Okay. <laughs> um, we've got the active recall and follow up, so yes. um, we're um, looking at our recall lists and, and, follow, and giving them a phone call if need be and we've found same. yeah we've found um, personal re um phone, that phone call is probably better than a letter or anything yeah, like that yeah, and, yeah it and just seems to be that personal the personal touch, touch. yeah mm -hmm. yeah and we in also contact. have we've got two clinics in our town sometimes they flick from one to the other whoever they can get into so um they may there for quite a while we didn't have any female GPs and we didn't have any nurses trained so they were going elsewhere for their cervical screening and that sort of thing and it's their choice we do have some nurse practitioner a nurse practitioner in the area that they go to as well so it gives them the opportunity to say to us no we've had that and we can follow it up so it's all that uh, discussion in education and, and again in that care plan time or in that um, health assessment time we just use that time to educate and discuss and mm -hmm. bring up yep. those questions. Mm -hmm. um, um, our, our continuing update and education, we're here today, um, you know, these sorts of things. Um, Follow-up results and giving the appropriate referral. So, yeah, um, following up 
corrected format, we found that um, we had oh, yeah. we were we weren't receiving our national browse screen in the correct format. So we had we and we still have, and there's nothing we can do about the past ones, except we can see that they have had it done. So we've updated their recall and all that sort of thing. But that won't be reflected in our numbers because those patients have actually had it and it's been faxed through to us, but it hasn't gone in electronically. Therefore, PenCat's not picking it up. So it, it's a work in progress. Um, and we've just, one of the best things we've probably done is started off our improvements with really small manageable groups. When we started doing our cervical screening and breast screen, I said to the girls, just take a very small glitch of it. It will just be overwhelming if you take the whole age group that are eligible. You'll never. You'll and and that's that's that. such um, that's such a perfect example of the PDSA methodology. Remember, we haven't spoken too much about that today. But the Plan Do Study Act, the um, the directive there is to test and so don't run with like this massive program at the outset. Test small and see whether your system is working. If it works, great, extend it out. But if it needs tweaking, it's better to do it at that early stage than to be in the middle of this massive rollout. So yeah, that's terrific. And with our management, we've just got um, making sure our IT is correct. Well, that's been a headache for the, for the <laughs> management at the moment because we're still not back online. Um, allocated time for staff support, staff support. It just isn't manageable. We, we have tried and tried, haven't we, to have allocated time. It just doesn't work, so it's, it's a it's case of yeah. doing it. Team meetings and training and development. Um, and so all this, hopefully, and it's really about getting the team on board. And we have had quite a few barriers to things we have done as nurses. We have had quite a few barriers, but it's just working through those barriers and just, and I mean, it, I try and put up our improvements because it can be just such a little thing like um, the identification of the Aboriginal of Torres Strait Islander. We do not have a very big community of Torres Strait Islanders and Aboriginals in our area. Um, but it's just, if the patient comes in, it's it's making sure it's entered correctly on the computer. Yeah. And that gets right back to your administration staff and everything yeah. like that. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yes, it Yes, <laughs> yeah, it matters it a lot. It matters to the yeah. patient care. Mm -hmm. So, and all that leads on to probably, hopefully, patient-centred care, better patient. And team communication. And team communication. Wonderful. Tell me about the hands on your, your map. <laughs> it's about embracing the whole team. Absolutely. Together and, and working. Absolutely. So um, be before we wrap up today too, I would invite everybody to take a photo of everybody else's map as well so that you can take some of that, that learning um, back to your team. Do you think that this is in a format that's actually useful for your team as well to whack it up in, yeah. in your staff room to say, well, look, these are some of the things that we were talking about when um, I wasn't at the practice on, on Thursday. I think um, the thing we probably should have right across here is our team leader mm. and um, I'm fortunate enough to have worked for nearly 20 years for a team leader who has looked outside the square even 20 years ago yeah. and developed that and is passionate about it. Yeah. So it's, and he could see that was his way of managing his yeah. clinic for better patient outcome. Well done. So, so many of the elements that you were talking about for me mentally were ticking off um, all of those elements of, of the 10 building blocks. So um, it, it really was framed in that way. My question for you too would be, um, what element of this particular mind map was something new that you're going to be uh, still working on and developing further? Or were, were there any other sort of light bulb elements that you thought, oh yeah, we could also, we might also, was there anything about that um, that you can that you can shed light on? Well, I think we, as we've got an idea, it's just all gone on and on, hasn't mm. it? Yeah. Kate? It's just one thing's led to the next, one yes. led to the next. Yeah. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a couple of things that I've personally thought of yep. that I can think, okay, I need to go back and and tweak, yep. tweak that yep. or, or talk about that or whatever. So. <gasps> wonderful. Excellent. So Yes, yes. Yep. Yeah, 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And if okay, some and, and if and if some of that can be done sort of here today, that's a really effective use of your your time too. That you actually know what your next steps might be when you um, get back to your, your your busy lives there. That um, you're really clear about some actionable steps that that come out of it. Yeah, I mean, we we have four nurses on on a Wednesday. That's our day where we have four nurses. And how many how many nurse meetings have we we, we had protected time, everything? But there's always something that comes. Yeah, up. we can't get that protected. That's life, isn't it? Well done. Thank you for that. Yay! <laughs> Can I invite you to come and share your, your map with us as well? Here we go. Come around. There we go. All right. So talk us through your map here. <laughs> so hello, I'm Jan, and uh, as I told you a while ago, I'm one of the practice nurses of Tri-Star Medical Group Avoca Victoria. So under the supervision of Kirsten and PHN, we are doing um, a quality improvement and we are focusing on breastfeeding because our clinic has a uh, lowest rate of breastfeeding in, in, in the area. So we have this, it's been going for um, since February, but technically we started July because um, of communication with head office. Because at, f uh, at first, head office will give us the recalls list of the females who have um, under screen. And then after we acquired the results from head office, um, it will be given to the receptionist. And then receptionist will give out, send out letters to the eligible patient and after we've given the letters they will um, comply and go to breast screen Victoria to have it done hopefully yes. hopefully yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, some of it we received the results but of course maybe some some clients forgot to tell them that they need to send the the results electronically to their GP or they, they're seeing other GP. So technically, the results that would be given to us will be uh, uh, faxed to us electronically but by uh, to the receptionist and it will be given to the doctors. And then after that, um, doctors will be the one to encourage patients to have, not only for the recalls, but all the clients and patients that are coming to our clinic to have a breast screening. And then uh, nurses are, we are the ones sending out flyers, putting posters on the clinic so that all the uh, patients will be aware of how, wh what's the use of breastfeeding, how, why are we doing breastfeeding, so we're doing that one. And then as of the moment, uh, we already had sent out letters and then uh, some results have come in, but we just noticed that main, one main problem of this um, quality improvement is the improper entering of results. Because pe uh, as of now, when we started 1%, until now it's 1%. Because of the improper, uh, PENCAT can uh, recognize it. Because when we receive the breast screen results, technically it should be on the results itself. But in our clinic, it went on to documents. <laughs> so of course, <laughs> pen, yeah. Yeah. pen cut, yeah, yeah. pen cut yeah. can uh, see that one. That's why until now we are very still one percent, and it it's the same thing to b b cervical screening because in medical director there should be a manual input for, b for cervical screening and the medical director, but of course when we receive results it will be uh, gone to uh, results and doctors. I know doctors are so busy so they can do it manually every time, so. What I propose as a solution, because our company is going paperless now, so they don't want to print out. So I told them to email me uh, the results for breast and cervical screening, and I will have double check it if the doctors have put it or not, and I will do it myself and put it on breast screen and uh, cervical screening. So that's our only solution as of mm -hmm. now. Yeah, but mm -hmm. I've, we have already gone steam meeting with the staff to do it so hopefully we can do it routinely so that our screening rates will improve as well so hopefully that will really that will help yeah that's excellent yeah yeah 
that, that was all on. Well done. I, I love the neatness of this map and, um, you know, the, you, can, you can see the, the artistry and the difference between the various maps and, and that's such a good thing uh, to see. Were there any questions um, about the process or um, in, any ideas that, that have come out of that, that that you would like to comment on? Just keeping it so sharp, it's really good. Yeah, it, it sounded like quite some sophisticated troubleshooting that you've gone through to get around an issue that is, is, is hampering the outcomes that you're seeing. And, and I think that's really, um, that's, that's really good effort, especially for the smaller practices to really sort of delve in and go, right, what can we do with this? That's the whole idea of, of what we're trying to achieve here. So it might seem you know, small to the practice, but it's actually really impactful and really want to encourage you to keep thinking along those lines and, and identifying those, those opportunities. So well done, that's, that's terrific. Thank Here you, you go, thank you. <laughs> Here we go, last ones. We're not very creative. <laughs> very limited pictures. I'll come around this side. That's okay. Okay, so um, we run a monthly trip to Breast Spring and uh, that's, we broke down the components that make it uh, work. Um, and we have, we start off with, we have breast screen recalls versus mammogram, as in diagnostic mammogram recalls. So if a woman has a diagnostic um, mammogram and they're recommended by the doctor to have follow-up at a certain stage, we will put in a mammogram one versus if a woman has a normal breast screen result, we will uh, identify a two yearly breast screen result. So we have our recalls, um, we have our pen cat data. So what we use the pen cat for is to identify women in our uh, practice who have no record of breast screening. And one of the things we've been doing well for eight and a half years, so we're, we're fine tuning but have been working on this for a long while, is that when clients come to the clinic and they fill in their registration form, there is a section that says, do you give permission for the clinic to populate your history about breast screening and cervical screening so we can make appropriate recommendations for your screening. And 98%, I reckon, would tick yes. Mm -hmm. So when they do that, then we're able to ring up breast screen and find out where they're at. Sometimes it's because they've had an invitation but they've never attended. Mm -hmm. So that generates our recall where it's possible or it generates an understanding of what's happened that they haven't screened. Um, so. And, and that's a close partnership with our local breast screen to do that. But anyone can ring your breast screen and check that. Mm. So then as results come in, we end up with a recall. Our nurse is an Aboriginal health worker. There's opportunities because the recalls are there for health checks, management plans, any opportunity uh, contact to look at the recall and go, do you know about the monthly trips? So the staff all know when they are, there's flyers, the doctors know when they are. So for the, um, the nurses, they all contribute in. It's like part of that working together team stuff. Uh, the empanelment, I've, I've got a... Yeah, well done. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> I was over there. I was taking off the book. <laughs> I was trying to read it on the other one, but now I've got it. Uh, the GPs, they also promote breast screening and they all have flyers in their office about the trip so they can direct women to go out and book in. Um, it's only Koori women, Aboriginal women and Torres Strait Islander women we take. Occasionally we make an exception to that because it's someone who's got specific screening needs or they're very apprehensive about going and then the group of women that goes make them very welcome, so it's nice. Um, admin, their role is to have the flyers there. They have a list from the end of one breast screen trip to the next one where they can 
take women's names down. It's then up to who is working with the recall list to actually check, one, they're eligible, um, and two, how's the best way to support them to go, whether they're Aboriginal or not. Clinic drivers, they're a critical thing to bring women in that have travel barriers to getting, they come to BADAC, but then we take them from BADAC to the assessment, uh, to the uh, screening service. Cultural safety, so for women, this has been the work, as I sort of mentioned earlier, between Breast Green and ourselves. So some of the factors for that are that we have private space when we go across. Breast Green actually run a screening clinic in the, their lunchtime, so the waiting room's empty. So it's just the women and it sort of becomes a nice little yarning session. Um, we have the gowns, which you'll see later. Um, we have um, all of the staff at Breast Green have had cultural training, so they understand a woman may want to have a family member go in for the screening, which is something that Breast Green normally don't promote. So they understand all the issues to make a difference. Um, no, no, no. If Breast Green assessment need to phone a client, and, and the travel across, even though it's only a few kilometres, enables us to have a conversation with the women talking about what we can offer to support the screening process, help them understand a bit more about it, particularly if they're new, help them to know that if they do get called back from assessment um, that uh, and the assessment clinic tries to ring them and can't get them because it's a private number, they may not answer, then they'll ring us and we will ring them and say, one of the nurses from Breast Green wants to talk to you and we sort of go through that process. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, so we often have family groups. In fact, when we started out this process, we'd have some of the staff coming to model that we should as women do this. Now we have a separate staff group because they're all in a little clump and pop up every two years and that's quite nice. And then sometimes we have staff mem members added into the clinic because we recognise it's important to support our staff as much as it is to support the women. Uh, we promote the screening dates through the newsletter. We provide food um, for the women that come along. It's not a meal even though it's at lunchtime, <laughs> but it's a little something. Um, the leadership is supported through the organisation and in our recent annual report, the gowns work was recognised, thanks Mary. An acknowledgement <laughs> of uh, what's this one? Oh, in the staff meetings, we talk about some of the specific cancer screening work as important. What does Breast Screen do to join with our process is that we send them a list of women as we have it about a week beforehand. They double check, even though we're pretty clear we've got our eligibility right, but they double check it for eligibility. Um, and the, we acknowledge that the list can change right up to the minute we're heading out. Yes. The door. <laughs> there was one woman who was coming on the list and she rang her sister and said, I'm out of smokes, can you bring some down to the co-op? <laughs> So she, and she said, well, thanks for bringing the spokes, but come on, come with me, I'm going for my breast screen. And the woman that came down was diagnosed with breast cancer and is well and enjoying life still. This is many years ago. So it can change and breast screen cope with that with an amazing sense of resilience mm -hmm. and non plusedness mm -hmm. you know? It's really lovely. So we, our symbols are the pink ribbon for breast screen and our gowns. The women are screened and then out of that, we have a negative screen, they have a recall, a diagnosis, they have the option of support to attend before diagnosis, the assessment clinic, support to attend a treatment triage. Because we're an Aboriginal service, we have the luxury of time to do that. Uh, support even women going to surgery if they have an example might mean that they've got poor literacy or they've had bad health service experiences so they're really apprehensive about hospitals. 
and um, in one circumstance a woman who was diagnosed needed to have six weeks of radiotherapy and so she was loaned a gown to take to feel culturally wrapped up while she went through her treatment. Um, and we've got our CQI improvement, maintain um, good, correct data, like, you know, what all of us are fighting with. Um, uh, prevention education days about it, share from meetings, talk about how many we book and how many attend, and that's a record we have kept for years because you might have 12 women booked and you might end up with three. Yeah. But that's three women screened. Yeah. So you just have to keep rolling with that resilience uh, to keep the screening being done. And um, at a previous presentation that one of the breast screen staff gave at the end of last year, our screening is in about 40 point something for Aboriginal women in our area. So it's not as high as we want it to be, but it's certainly higher than it has been in the past. So there we are. Thank you. Did you want to? Did you want to um, put on display oh, some of your gowns? Oh, I think we really do want to see them. We can do it after lunch. After lunch? Yeah. After okay. Lunch. We'll do the gowns after lunch. In the story, we'd love to share as part of it. I think that's that's tremendous. Uh, thank you. You can Beautiful. you can take that. So, yeah, well done, well done. I'm, I'm really blown away by the detail that's gone into particularly um, the, the, breast, uh, the breast cancer screening component. I guess Kim and I have come into this thinking we're going to hear some sort of similarity um, al along what we heard in, in the, previous, uh, the, the previous two workshops. Um, but there is some really innovative thinking going on and really applying that, uh, that uniqueness of what this presents for you. And, and that's marvellous. I'm really, you know, really very chuffed at that, that deep level thinking.